Hello, Parkway. I mean, well, Facebook family. Uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Almondo David Torres. People know me as David. Uh, when they mention Almondo, they say, I never met the guy. But then when they say David, oh, yeah, that guy with the white hair. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we've had uh, a little time here to spend with uh, Joe, Pastor Joe Hanthorn. I uh, never met him. This is our first time. Uh, in fact, I was a total stranger when I called him to ask him to do this, but I did it because you guys kept texting me and sending me uh, uh, messages uh, to do it. And he so kindly uh, accept a stranger's um, phone call, uh, and now here he is today. So we're, we thank you for that. I'm Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and your wife's name is Amber. That's correct. Amber. Yeah. How long have you been married? We have been married for, I better get this right, we've been married. Married for 17 years. 17 Six, years? 16 years. Six, okay. Yeah, 16 years. Yeah, let me get this right. I would say as you get older, you know, you forget those things, but he doesn't have any white hair. Well, he's got a little bit. <laughs> so wait till he gets my age, then he'll, you know, he'll have a legi uh, legitimate uh, reasoning uh, of why he doesn't be able to, he can't pinpoint that. Uh, also, now you've been a pastor uh, at Christian Life Church, which is out in Mequon. That's correct. Right? Yep. For 12 years now. 12 years. The lead yep. pastor, in fact. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, and my son David told me that you have a wonderful testimony. Uh, I know uh, you're all excited to hear his testimony. People couldn't wait until he came on. Well, the, well, the time is here. But prior to uh, him telling this testimony, I do want to go through uh, a few notes I have here. Again, I'm going to ask that everyone please share this. Go up to your Facebook page and you can share this with everybody with, uh, that's on your Facebook page. But if you'll just take a moment to do that because that's very important to people that you can touch. You know, we've been sitting around at home all day wondering, hey, I wonder what I could do to help uh, reach my friends. Well, you, this is a great uh, avenue, a great way of doing it. And all you have to do is touch that button that says share, and all your friends can receive this. I just had my brother come over uh, recently, and, and his name is Corey. He told me, almost in tears, that he went to work. He works for UPS, and for the first time, he was able to sit down with people he works with in a, in a round table, and uh, one was his boss. And for the first time, he got to share his story with them. He told them about these testimonies that we've been giving. And he doesn't even have a Facebook page, but they all wanted to hear it. So he went ahead and got a Facebook page. This way they could hear every single testimony we have on there. Uh, and But just to show you what God's doing. Uh, and uh, he, he, he felt, he told me he didn't want to just sit at home doing nothing. So all he did was do that. Now he's going to press share as uh, I had asked you to do. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on the testimonies. We have had a huge response. I'm going to tell you, thousands of people are watching this testimony. Not hundreds, but thousands of people. We also have had two baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. One was Aaron, and the next was Adali. Adali uh, and uh, those are Grisilda Morocho's uh, niece and nephew. They drove over to Chicago, stayed at a hotel just so they could be baptized. Because in Chicago, you have to uh, be back home by 5 o'clock, and then there's a lockdown. So they spend the night here, and uh, the two were baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, and that was, Angel gave them one Bible study. One Bible study, just on baptism. Uh, and I, I've always given Bible studies. What I don't understand is why more people don't do it. Right now, we have a great opportunity, a great tool to do things, and you could Skype Bible studies, and we're Skyping them. Right now, we have both, both our Bible study classes, people have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. Why isn't it not happening in other places? Because we're not doing it. So we really need to get up and, you know, this time right now is created just for this purpose. We have a great opportunity, and so I would hope that we'd go out there and do those things. Uh, we have a big following in Africa, and this is for you, uh, Dana, uh, because uh, uh, you love going out to Kenya, and you guys are doing a great job. We have all kinds of people uh, that are our friends from Kenya. We have pastors, apostolic, one God, uh, fearing men of God, that 
had joined our, our Facebook page. Uh, and not just one, but several. And we have pastors from all over at this point. With Jenny Miller, now we also have an Asian group of people coming in. Uh, and I know everyone loved Jenny Miller's uh, uh, testimony. She is going to finish that in, in, in the following week. She has part two to it. Uh, also, we, uh, we posted uh, Pastor Art Wilson and Mike Brown. They had about a 30-minute clip, uh, and it was referenced to end-time scenarios. And what they talked about was the ID 2020. So I highly recommend uh, when you get a chance, you don't want to miss that. If you want to know what's going on, if you want the pulse of God to see what's going on throughout our, our world, you're going to want to watch that. I also put out a clip that took 30 minutes, uh, and it was, uh, will the church go through the wrath of God? Uh, people are constantly asking me all kinds of questions. Go watch that. It's a 30-minute clip. Uh, it's not an hour and a half to two-hour Bible study that I normally do. Go that, and, and I think it's going to touch your heart. Also, we have uh, Gerald McLean. He will be testifying on the 30th. That's a Thursday, um, this Thursday, in fact. If you can't uh, see it live, it's going to be pre -recorded. It's going to be on our Facebook page. And share those. When you guys get that and you watch those things later, oh, it's at 5, 5, 5.30. At 5.30 uh, is uh, when we're going to carry that live. You can always share that. Any of our material, you can put it on your web page and share it. Okay, all this is free. I'm going to tell you the caliber of uh, ministers, uh, preachers, evangelists that we have giving testimonies, it's nowhere else. You can't find it. This is the only place you can find it. And we're telling you, take the material and put it out there. Okay, um, also, um, and I already told you about Jenny Miller. With that, I am going to. Uh, I'm going, to let Pastor, uh, I'm going to have uh, Pastor Joe Hanthorn. He's going to take it from here, uh, and uh, he will close in prayer. And I do have some things that I want to finish off with that I'll talk to you once he's done. Pastor, thank you very much. Brother Torres, thank you for the opportunity mm -hmm. to be here. I appreciate it. And uh, it is a, a privilege and an honor to be able to share my testimony. Um, it is something that I have, I have been able to do on a number of occasions, and I, I certainly don't take it lightly. I, I count it an honor. And a privilege to be able to share what the Lord has done in my life. And uh, I, I, I treat this as a, a, a great privilege and a great honor. So thank you for tuning in and um, giving me the opportunity just to share uh, a little bit of what God has done in my life uh, over the last um, 25 years uh, or so. Um, I'll start uh, at the beginning. I, I, was, I was raised uh, in an apostolic home. Um, I grew up in, in Christian school, uh, went to um, a, uh, a wonderful church. It was a growing, vibrant church in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, parents were very committed. My dad was a Bible study teacher. Um, my dad had made a, a promise to God uh, before my brother and I were born in 74 and in 76, respectively. Um, that he would live for God if God gave him children. And uh, my dad did his very best to make good on that promise. And um, we had great experiences early on. Um, unfortunately, uh, my mom and dad um, both came from uh, broken families and both came from very, very difficult home lives growing up. Um, somewhere around, um, I, it's hard for me to pinpoint a year or a date because I was a child, but, but I'm guessing somewhere between the ages of eight and 10, um, things started shifting uh, in our home. Um, my, my parents' um, relationship with the church uh, was, was uh, very tense, and um, thus our, our, our commitment level to the church was diminished, and uh, it, it wasn't long uh, till that lack of commitment or, or whatever it was, uh, began to take its toll on our family. And um, many of the old, uh, the old uh, struggles and old, uh, call it old demons or generational curses uh, that my parents had had to deal with um, as children began to revisit our home and uh, we began to have to, to deal with some very unpleasant things in our life. And I certainly don't, uh, don't need to go into all of that 
but suffice it to say, it was not a good situation uh, for any of us. And um, as much as uh, my mom uh, continued trying to um, live for God and, and attend church um, into my young teen years, um, she she struggled in that. And um, we relocated to an area where my parents didn't have any kind of a uh, an apostolic foundation or apostolic base. And it wasn't long before our home was um, was completely different than how it had started when I was a young man or, or a child. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, probably have witnessed our families go through changes. And uh, especially as a child, you don't always know why or what the cause is. Um, but so it was, so it was with me. Uh, suffice it to say that by the time that I was I was 13 or 14. I was I was starting to um, I was starting to drift very significantly. I began to experiment with a lot of things that many teenagers experiment with, and um, one thing led to another. By the time that I was I was 16, I had quit high school. Um, I had decided after the ninth grade to, to drop out of high school. Um, was experimenting very very heavily um, with drugs and alcohol at the time. Um, by the time that I was 17, I started using methamphetamine and LSD at a, at a very, very high rate. Um, by the time I was 18, I was a full-on needle junkie, uh, sticking needles in my arms, uh, slamming as much meth as I could get my hands on. Um, I, I found myself a very hollow individual. Um, I was using so much drugs um, that I was, I was getting involved in criminal activity uh, to try to support the habit that I had cultivated in my life, and um, I'll never forget one night. I, well, let me back up. I was I was on two felony probations uh, when I was 17 years old. I had I had committed two different burglaries in the state of Texas. I grew up in in the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, and I had committed two two burglaries uh, when I was 17 years old. Um, was placed on felony pro probation for both of those uh, burglaries. One for five years, and the other for four. Um, I was, uh, I was then released and uh, on probation, but continued to use drugs, continued to skirt my, my drug screening process and, and, and all of that. Um, and one night in November of 1994, uh, when I was strung out on, on cocaine, um, I, uh, with a couple of friends of mine, committed an armed robbery in Sherman, Texas. And um, I, was, I was soon apprehended for that. Um, one of my one of my buddies rolled over and and uh, squealed on us, and uh, we found ourselves locked up. And uh, I did what I've what I've always done uh, most of my young life. Uh, you know, there was struggle in our home, uh, and uh, I, I don't want to don't want to get into too much of that. But but I played the game well, and I, I would always call my mom, and I would always talk about how how sorry I was and how things could be different this time and how that I was going to live for God and I was going to do right and, and I just needed her to give me a chance and to post my bond and uh, and this was my wake up call I would live for God and so I did that this time November 94 I called my mom and I just I, I cried and told her how sorry I was and and uh, that uh, that I was going to go to church and I was going to get things right and uh, she came and posted my bond for me and uh it was just a, just a short time before I was right back to using, uh, but this time the addiction and the, the, the drug issues were compounded with this, this overwhelming sense of fear um, because I knew that I had crossed a line. Um, I was on two felony probations when I committed this armed robbery, and this is back in the day before they had uh, all of the all of the computer systems and the county systems connected, and so I was on probation in, in in a different county that I committed the armed robbery in, and so it would be a matter of time before my PO or my probation officer uh, learned that I had been arrested again for another crime, and so I was out on bond. But I knew that as soon as my PO found out that I had been arrested, that they were going to issue a a revocation warrant for me, and that I was probably facing very serious prison time. So just to paint the picture, I was 18 years old. I, I was using a, a, a very uh, large amount of uh, coke and meth and LSD and smoking pot. Um, I had quit high school. I 
probably I probably had somewhere about maybe 20 or 25 jobs uh, from the time that I was 16 until I was about 18. I couldn't be trusted. I was a chronic thief. I was a liar. Um, my mom would have to hide her purse when she came home from work at night because she knew that I would I would steal money from her. Uh, one time she left her keys out and I wound up stealing her car and taking it to Colorado. I just had I had no boundaries whatsoever in my life. I was I was living for the moment, and um, you know I, I, I the the drugs that I was using were already starting to take a toll on my body. Um, even at the age of 18, after having only used meth for you know a year and a half, two years. I was already having very serious um, physical uh, problems as a result of that with my teeth and uh, my face was broke out. I weighed about 115 pounds, um, just, just dealing with all of this and then compound that with the fact that I'm, 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 I'm there and I'm facing a, a first degree felony armed robbery, uh, which is my third felony and it's the violation of two probations. And so I knew that I was facing some very serious prison time. Uh, that with the drugs, that with the abuse in our home, that with all the other stuff that we had to deal with, um, brought me to a breaking point in my life. And um, there was uh, several points in, in November and December of 94 where I contemplated taking my own life, uh, where I, I really seriously questioned whether my life was redeemable uh, whether there was anything left that could be fixed in me. Um, I, I'll never forget as a kid, you know, growing up in an apostolic church, um, having aspirations as a, as a five, six, seven-year-old kid, looking up to preachers, talking about wanting to be a missionary someday. And, and that seemed so distant when I was 18. It seemed so lost. It, it seemed like everything that had happened to me, everything that had happened in our home, everything that I had done, had robbed my future from me. And I felt like I just had a hollow core, that I had no future and I had no hope. And um, it was in that environment uh, a couple of times where I, I tried to intentionally overdose. I'll never forget one night I, I, I laid out, I think it was in December of 94, I laid out three 60 unit shots back to back and I slammed them uh, one right after the other just in an attempt to, to numb the pain and, and uh, uh, doing all I could to run from who I was. And one night, out of, out of absolute desperation, um, still fearful of all this impending legal drama uh, caving in on me, I, I, it was in January of 95, I remember asking uh, my parents, um, my mom was still trying to go to church on and off, and uh, I asked if, um, if I could visit with their pastor. Not a man that I knew. Uh, I don't even know if I'd ever met him. Maybe I had, uh, but if I did, I didn't know him well. And I remember going to the little church that night in Sherman, Texas, and I sat in front of this preacher, and I just began to tell him um, how messed up my life was and how hopeless I felt and how I felt like there was no answer. And I, I'm a ninth-grade dropout. I've got this addiction. I've got some health issues going on. I, I can't hardly concentrate from all the LSD that I've been all the acid that I've been tripping. And uh, then I've got all this fear of the future. And I'll never forget just pouring my heart out to him that night. And, uh, and he leaned across his desk after I was done. And he said some words that absolutely changed my life. He said, son, God is not your bail bondsman. He said, but if you're looking for life change, God is in fact in the life changing business. And those words, it was challenging, but it was medicine for my soul. It spoke hope into my life right where I was. No games with God. But if you're serious about life change, God is still in the life changing business. He began to talk to me about repentance. And, and uh, before we were done that evening, I remember getting down at a little chair in his office and uh, just started to open my heart. And I, I had been such a liar. I'd been such a con. And I, I would lie even when lying didn't make sense. And all of a sudden, here I am before God, starting to say things about myself that I wouldn't share with anybody else. Uh, starting to be real with God. Starting to be honest with God. And I just started pouring my heart out. Tears just began to fall from my eyes. And, and I wept into the cushion of that chair and 
just really had a broken spirit about me. And there was that, that and, and that comes with repentance. Brokenness is a part of repentance. It's acknowledging the wrong in our life, but it's also a surrender. It's, it's, you're always going to be broken when you surrender. You can't surrender to God without breaking the hardness of your own human heart. And um, I got up from that, that encounter that night, and uh, I, I remember going home, and I felt clean. I felt like I'd emptied a lot out. I felt like I'd had a load lifted off of me in that moment of repentance. But I, I also sensed when I got home that, that repentance wasn't complete, that, that there was still a, a part of repentance that I needed to act upon. See, repentance isn't just sorrow. The Bible talks about uh, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, uh, not to be repented of. But there's also the sorrow over the fact that I'm in a mess. We can also sometimes, I remember one young man told me uh, not long ago, he said, you know, I, I would come to the altar and pray and everybody thought I was praying through and he said, I was just having an emotional breakdown. And, and I think sometimes people aren't ready to repent. They're just emotionally overwhelmed and they're just having an emotional moment. Repentance isn't just the emotion. It involves the emotion, but it's more than that. I remember going home after I had that emotional moment, that breaking moment, and, and coupled with that emotion was this, this call of God, this, this sense that if I wanted to be different, I could be, but that I had to be willing to take some steps and make some decisions that would free God up to start the restorative process in my life. And, and one of those things that I needed to do was I needed to get rid of some stuff. And so I remember going through my room that night and I had, I had posters and I had music. I was into the, into the grunge scene in the early 90s. I loved mosh pits and, and Stone Temple Pilots and Pantera and Sepultura and all those bands and uh, was into all that nonsense. And, and I, I got all of my music and I threw all my CDs away. I, I ripped posters off the wall and I, I went to a little stash that I had on one of the shelves in my room and I had probably somewhere between two and three thousand dollars worth of fronted dope both meth and coke and uh, it was it was dope that that I was selling for a dealer I had cut it so that I could use some of it and uh, you know it wasn't something I could give back to him uh, I had to sell it so I could pay him so I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be in trouble with him and I remember taking taking those baggies and going into the restroom and uh, standing over the standing over the commode there in my parents' bathroom and arguing with myself because I, I didn't want to flush this dope. I knew that if I did this, there was, going to be, there was going to be trouble. I knew that my dealer was not going to take that very well uh, for me to owe him two or $3,000 and not have the dope or not have the money to pay him. But I also knew that I, I didn't need to worry about the outcome. That at some point, I had to make decisions based on right and wrong, not on what was convenient or expedient for me. And I remember standing over the toilet and something broke in me. And I realized that if I ever wanted to be different, that I had to take a stand. And I had to draw a line about what I was going to do, what I believed, and what I wanted for my future. And it was then that I started just throwing those little baggies into the toilet. I broke my needles. I threw those away, and for the next two weeks or so, I struggled. I struggled. I mean, I, I had a raging addiction. I was I was battling depression in my mind. Um, all of the all of the the relationship challenges from the past were weighing on me. And I, here I was trying to make a step toward God. I had done the right thing. I had flushed this dope, and there was a there was a line drawn, but the battle was not over. The battle was far from over for my soul. And for the next two, two and a half, three weeks, maybe, I struggled immensely, questioning whether I even needed to go back to church. And one, one Sunday night, I, I remember going, riding with my mom to the church. And uh, I, I was there that night, and I, I, I sat in the back. My head was shaved bald. I had a ponytail growing out of the top of my head. I had body piercings all over. I was wearing a cut-off flannel shirt rocking all my tats and, and you know, just, just, just had this little bit of an attitude still going on. And I remember sitting at the back of the, the, the sanctuary that night and my pastor preached. I couldn't tell you what he preached. And I just kind of sat back there with this smug look on my face. And I, I got up two or three times to 
go out and smoke a cigarette during the service and and uh, would come back in and just kind of sit there very stoic, very unmoved. It's a small church, maybe 60 or 70 people, so I was, I was very noticeable in that small group of people. Uh, the pastor finished and gave the altar call and others were up praying and I remember he came back by me during the altar call and he said, Joe, I want to pray for you. And I expected one of those, oh, God, touch his heart. God, help him. God, help him move in his life. And um, I didn't get that. He put his hand on my shoulder and he simply said this. He said, God, I pray that you would give Joe a profound fear and respect for your dealing with him and your working in his life. You know, the Bible teaches us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I, I, I needed that that night. I, I didn't know how bad I needed that, but I needed that. I, as soon as he prayed that, I, I got up and I started to go outside and smoke another cigarette. And I stopped in the bathroom on the way out and I was washing my hands. And I remember looking in the mirror and it was as if God took the blinders off of my eyes and I saw what an absolutely disgusting wretch I was. What a liar, what a fraud I was. And I almost, I saw myself in such a vivid way that I almost panicked. And I remember reaching in my pocket and grabbing that box of Marlboro Reds and I crushed them and I threw them in the trash can and I walked out, walked down to the front of the church. I tapped Brother Copeland on the shoulder and I said, I need to be baptized tonight. And he was stunned. Uh, this was in January of, uh, of 1995 in Texas. Uh, it's not as cold there as it is here in Wisconsin, uh, but it can get cold. It was, I think, in the 40s or 50s, and they ran water right out of the water hose into the baptistry to baptize me. And so it was almost instant Holy Ghost when I got into the water. Um, but I remember climbing into that cold water, and, and the pastor just said to me, he said, when we baptize you in Jesus' name, he said, every one of your sins are going to be washed away. He said, you're going to be buried with Christ. All of your past is going to be gone. And he said, when you come out of this water, I want you just to lift your hands and I want you to begin to worship God. And I did exactly what he said. The last thing I heard them say before I went under the water was, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I got a name that night that connected me to a family that had zero dysfunction. I, I got connected to a family that was the family of God. It, it, it wasn't a family that, that had all the shame and, and all the hardship that so many people's family have connected to it. I found the identity and I found the belonging that I had been looking for my whole life. I was baptized in that name. I came out of the water. I lifted my hands and all of a sudden with stammering lips, with, with a trembling lip, I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave me the ability and God gloriously and miraculously filled me with the Holy Ghost right there in that tank. It was the most powerful thing that I'd ever felt in my life. It was unmistakable, undeniable that God had just touched my soul. And from that night to this day, I've never put a needle back in my arm except for medical reasons. I've never drank alcohol. I've never smoked cigarettes. God supernaturally delivered me that night. God broke the chains of addiction in my life and God started a process of restoration in my life. I, I thank God for the moment when God shows us his love, when God touches us and lets us feel his presence. But what we have to understand is that God's touch on our life is never the finished product. God's touch on our life is always to initiate a journey in our life, a journey that's going to involve a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties, roads that we don't count on. And little did I know then, standing there in that baptistry, the road that lay ahead of me, I had just felt the hand of God. I had just felt forgiveness. I had just felt the absolute washing away of the crimes and the ugly things that I had done and said and been a part of. It was all gone as far as God was concerned. But see, the thing is, God won't waste anything in our life. God won't even waste our mistakes. God won't even waste our sin. God will use our sin and God will use our mistakes to grow our character by allowing us to deal with the issues and the consequences of those mistakes. How naive I was 
Now, I never said, God, I'll live for you if. I never said that. But I thought it. I, I, I wanted God to relieve me of the impending felony convictions and potential prison sentence. I wanted that gone. I wanted God to remove all of that from me. But God wanted to use all of that. And so many times we come to God and we try to make deals with God. And, and God doesn't deal on our terms. God deals with and works with surrendered hearts. And if our heart's not surrendered, God's not in the let's make a deal business. And so about two months after I was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, I was living for God. I remember going to the church every morning for prayer. One of our associate pastors, a guy named Kelly, used to come pick me up. And he'd drive me to the church, and, and we'd pray together in the morning, and I started working with him in an auto body shop. And, and I man, things are looking up for me. And I even spotted a girl in the church that I had my eye on, thinking, oh, man, God can do something here and, and, and put together a life for me. And all this is going through my mind. And little did I know that God had a completely different plan in mind. Two months after I was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, all of my past came back. The probation officers issued the warrant for my arrest. My bond was forfeited for the armed robbery, and I found myself incarcerated, locked up in jail. I'll never forget the day that I was in the back of the squad car on the way to the Denton County Sheriff's Department, praying and talking to God with these two detectives in the front seat, probably thinking I'm crazy. And I'm just telling God, God, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live for you. Even if I go to jail, I'm going to live for you. Help me to live for you. And uh, I went to jail, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a way out. I called my mom. I, I called a few people. What's, what's the possibility of get, get, getting bonded out? And they said, no, no bond this time. You're in here on probation revocation. And that's not a bondable issue, at least in Texas at that time it wasn't. And uh, so there was no hope of me getting out on bond and just had to settle into being there in jail. And I remember uh, I made up my mind that I was going to live for God. Even in this adverse environment, I was gonna, I was gonna have a prayer life, and I was gonna fall in love with the Bible. I knew zero about Scripture. I, I may have knew, known one or two popular verses, but I knew nothing about doctrine. I knew nothing about living for God, about how the Bible worked, and and where the books were, and and how the theme worked together. Knew none of that. But I, but I got a hold of a Bible, and I just started consuming that little Bible. And in the in the in the. Uh, jail that I was in. It was just a large dorm, 50, uh, 25 bunks, 50 people total in this, in this big pod. They call it a pod. And there was a little, a little uh, visitation room attached to the pod. And it was all glassed in. You could see it from the, uh, from the, uh, the pod that we were in. They would let uh, attorneys and other people come in there and visit with, uh, with inmates. And I remember asking the guards, and, and God just showed me favor. I remember asking the guards if I could use that room every day after they brought our meals in to pray, that I wanted a, a place to pray. And and they, they said yes. And so I started going in every day after they brought the meals. And I would sit there in a little red plastic chair in my orange jumpsuit. And I would rock back and forth and just begin to, I didn't know how to pray. No one had ever taught me how to pray. I'd, I'd listened when I was at church going to prayer in the early morning hours. I'd listen to those guys pray. But I really didn't know how to pray. I'd pray for five or ten minutes and run out of stuff to say, or maybe two minutes and run out of stuff to say, and then I would just sit there and listen. But from listening to apostolic people pray, I had learned how to pray. I didn't realize it, but I had learned. And when the pressure was on, I would sit there in that plastic chair, and I would just start singing, and I would start talking to the Lord, and tears would flow. And all of a sudden, I didn't realize it, but I was starting to develop a walk with God. I was starting to understand what it meant to hear the voice of God and, and to push through to a point of actually not just praying, but praying through until I connected with the heart of God. During this time, I, I'm, I'm you know unsure about what my sentence looks like. I, I, I violated a five-year probation and a four-year probation. And then I've got an armed robbery where I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, anywhere from five to 99 years on, on an aggravated sentence, and it's my third felony. The DA offered me a four-year plea bargain, which then seemed like an eternity, but now seems like a gift. And uh, I remember uh, thinking to myself, I can't spend four years in prison. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I've got my whole life ahead of me. Surely, surely God is going to work in this situation and God is going to get me out of this. God's going to open a door. God's going to work a miracle. And I'm going to have a great testimony about how God kept me 
from going to prison. That's what was in my mind. So our church was praying toward that end. I was praying and fasting toward that end while I was in jail. I had a court-appointed attorney who was a godsend. He was just a he was such a wonderful man, which is a very unusual thing for court-appointed attorneys sometimes. Uh, this guy was just a godsend, and, and he, he, he worked really hard for me. And I remember he and my pastor set up a meeting with the district attorney. Uh, the assistant district attorney had offered us the four-year plea bargain. And uh, we felt like that was just, that wasn't, God was going to work a miracle. God was going to get me probation. God was going to get me reinstated. That's what we thought. And uh, so we decided to go over the assistant DA's head and take this to the district attorney. And my attorney and my pastor met with him. And uh, I was so excited that day. I remember praying. I think I fasted to the, to the lead up of that. And we just knew a, a miracle was coming. And I got on the little collect phone and I, and I called my attorney's office. I think it was probably four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And um, I said, Scott, when I got him on the phone, I said, Scott, give me the good news. And he said, Joe, there's no good news to give you. He said, when I spoke to the district attorney and he looked at your file, he said that his, his assistant had made a mistake and that there was no way that they could offer you four years, that you are a three-time loser. This is your third felony. And the least they could offer you would be a 20-year prison sentence with a minimum of 16 served. Now, for an 18-year-old, that's the end of my world. I mean, that's, that's the equivalent of my life being spent in prison. It was, it was incomprehensible for me. The, the, the hurt in that moment is hard for me to describe to you. The, the, the temptation to feel like God failed me was huge. But I had developed a habit. One of the things that I just told our young people in our church is habit will always take you further than desire. And I had developed a habit of prayer. And that habit held me in a moment when my world had been turned upside down. And I remember going into that little room that the officers would make available for me after that phone call. And I remember sitting there doing what I had learned to do. And I just started praying. I was numb all over. My mind was just blown from the realization that I'm probably going to spend 16 years in prison. I, I couldn't take it to jury trial. I was guilty. My, my buddy had rolled over on me. They had all the facts they needed. I would have been I would have been found guilty in a heartbeat facing a jury. I'd have been in big trouble. And so my only hope was a plea bargain. And now my only hope had turned to a minimum of 16 years. So I'm talking to God. And I, and I start praying what I know I'm supposed to pray. And I start saying things like, God, if I've got to spend five years in prison, Lord, if, if, if I've got to spend 20 years in prison, Whatever it takes to make me the man that you want me to be, God, I'll do it. Lord, whatever you need to do to me to get me right, and whatever I've got to go through to become the person you want me to be, I'll do it. And then I prayed the most important prayer of my life. I said, and I quote, Lord, I don't mean a word of that. But would you bring me to a place in my life that I could say things like that and really mean them? And the minute I said that, my heart broke. And all of the numbness from the shock of the revelation of 16 years in prison was gone. And the brokenness and the tenderness of God filled that moment. And it was like God said, okay, son, I finally got you in a really vulnerable, surrendered position where I can start building you up. That, 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 that position would have to be tested again and again over the next five years. Eventually, I was, I was given an opportunity um, to plea bargain again. Uh, my, my attorney just made some pretty amazing moves. Again, court appointed. It was a God thing. And they wound up giving me a, a, an eight-year plea bargain. And so I signed to eight years there, eight years for another one, and four, uh, four years for the other one. So a total of 20 years, all served concurrently. So it was really an eight-year sentence, but a total of 20 years. And uh, I wound up serving five years and two months in a maximum security prison. I was locked up from the time that I was 18 until I was 24. 
God had started a journey. God had spoken hope into my life. God had filled me with the Holy Ghost. But God was not going to waste my sin. And God was not going to waste my past. I was going to have to deal with the consequences of those mistakes because God was going to use those consequences to build my future. So many times we hate the consequences, the memories of our past, but what we have to understand is God will not waste anything in our story. God, God doesn't just erase it and say, okay, it's gone, let's pretend like it never happened. God says, I'm going to erase the consequences eternally, but I'm going to use the temporal consequences. I'm going to use the memories. I'm going to use the other, I'm going to deepen you by this. And so God began to work in my life. Five years in prison, I fell in love with my Bible. I consumed my Bible. I remember one pastor came to see me at the request of my parents, and he brought me one of the greatest gifts that I ever got in my life. It was a teacher's manual of exploring God's Word without the spiral bound, because I may kill somebody or kill myself with it. Um, gave me the loose leaf, exploring God's Word, uh, teacher's manual, and I ate it. I, I consumed it. I taught myself exploring God's Word in prison and uh, just fell in love with my Bible. I could take you to my office today and show you several Bibles that literally are falling apart uh, because I just got into them. And I let the Lord lead me and deepen me. And five years of prison, I don't have time tonight to go into everything, but, but five years in prison, I faced some very serious, fearful times where I was threatened physically. Uh, prison is an immensely racial environment, at least it is in Texas. And um, I had, I had uh, you know, the blacks that, 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 didn't, that they didn't care for me. They were, they were out to get me because I was this white boy. Uh, I had the whites that hated me because I was not down for the Aryan cause. Uh, you know, I, I didn't, didn't really have any problems with the, with the Hispanic group in there, but I was caught all the time between the, the whites and the blacks. And, and uh, my first day on a prison uh, unit there, at Clemens unit, I did some time in Huntsville, but also did some time south of Houston in a place called Brazoria, the Clemens unit. And uh, my first day there, there was a race riot that kicked off. Uh, I was gassed multiple times throughout my time of being there because I got caught up in riots. There were men who were actually killed on the unit that I was at. Um, it was a very, very dangerous environment. I remember one time walking down the hallway on our way to the chow hall and looking up and seeing a, a guard on a catwalk with a gas mask on holding a riot gun. And I thought to myself, man, what kind of a place am I in? And yet God had me right where he wanted me. While I was in prison, I, I, I not only deepened in my walk with God, uh, I had the opportunity to teach Bible studies. I, I watched men receive the Holy Ghost, both in chapel services, but also in our jail cells. Prayed with men. I remember standing in Huntsville in a jail cell one time with me and one of my cellmates, with him standing there with his hands lifted up, praying for him that God would fill him with the Holy Ghost. I remember teaching officers Bible studies. God opened doors for me repeatedly. But the biggest thing that God did in my life was he taught me to trust the process. I didn't understand the process. When I got turned down for my first parole, I didn't understand the process. When I prayed for my second parole after, a, after I think a year and a half or so, and I didn't get that parole, I didn't understand the process. When I got turned down for my third parole, I still didn't understand the process. And then God, when it was his time, God opened the door on my fourth parole for me to get out of prison and I was released from prison in, in May of 2000. I could tell you stories about how God spared me one time when the, the Aryan circle put a hit out on me because I wasn't down for the cause or when another guy tried to, tried to make me his, uh, his personal possession uh, in a very tense environment. Uh, and, and yet God intervened every time. Not one time was I ever molested. Not one time was I ever assaulted. God preserved me. I found to be true the word of God, when he says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. God knows how to protect us. I remember one night when I was threatened by a man, and uh, I've told this story before, a guy told me that I was going to either get with him or pay for protection, or that he was going to take me out. And he had a couple of guys on the unit that already belonged to him. He was a seasoned veteran. He, he had punked some guys and and I hope that's okay. I don't mean to be too raw here, but you know, some things had happened, and 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 so he told me I had till seven o'clock that night to make up my mind what I wanted to do. I remember going back to my cell. 
I was on the third tier. It was four tiers high, 25 cells long. And I remember going back to my cell and just staying there that night. And for the next couple of days, I, I wouldn't come out of my cell. I was scared out of my mind. I, I felt like nobody in the world knew where I was. I couldn't go to the guards because snitches get stitches. And, and I knew that my life would be over in prison if I went and ratted on this guy. And so I just didn't know what to do. And I remember sitting there in that little cell, I started quoting a passage of scripture I'd memorized out of the book of Psalm, Psalm 142, where it says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and with my voice unto the Lord I poured out my supplication. I showed before him my complaint. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. I looked on my right hand and beheld no man would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Then I cried unto thee, O Lord, and said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. And I prayed that prayer, and I prayed that prayer, and I prayed that prayer over and over again, until finally, in that darkness, the heavens opened up, and God's presence met me in that little cell. Everybody else was gone off the off the unit that day, and this this man was coming back to my to my bars all throughout those couple of days that I was in my cell, and he would taunt me, and he would he would try to incite me and say all kinds of horrible things to me. And finally, he said, "Next time the doors roll, they rolled every hour on the hour." He said, "I'm going to come into your cell." I knew then I didn't want to be in a cell alone with this guy, so I came out. When the doors rolled, I grabbed my Bible and I felt like the Lord had spoken to me and given me assurance, and so I went into the day room. And this, this man, this would-be uh, this would be provocateur, this man who had a, he, he was going to be a perpetrator against me, he was sitting in there all by himself, and I walked in with my Bible. And he jumped up off that bench, and he said, he said, you brought that Bible in here because you think that book will keep me from jumping on you. And I felt the Holy Ghost. And I looked at him, and I said, this book and these pages can do nothing. But the God that wrote this book met with me. And he assured me that you won't do anything. Well, he was stunned. He sat down on the bench and I walked over and sat down next to him and we started talking. I started sharing my testimony with him for the next three hours. I just began to talk to him about God, about the love of God, about restoration. And he told me things like, I, I tried being a Christian once. And I said, but have you ever received the Holy Ghost? Have you ever been filled with God's spirit? And he hadn't. So I told him about it. He wound up coming to church with me that very next Sunday. He told me at the end of that conversation, he said, I don't know why. He said, but I'm going to let you make it. And uh, I didn't say to him, but I know why. He, 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 he could think he did it, but I knew, I knew who was in charge of that whole situation. And I could tell you story after story of how God protected and preserved me because I made up my mind that I was going to live for God. I made up my mind that I was going to pray every day while I was in prison. I remember getting down on my knees and praying in a huge room filled with people slamming dominoes on a, on a table. And I just made up my mind, I'm going to pray. I'm going to be a man of prayer. I'm going to be a Daniel in this hour. And I'd have guys come by and say, hey, man, it's okay. Nobody's going to hurt you. And my pride would start to well up because I'm like, this guy thinks I'm down here praying because I'm scared. And I'm just down here praying because I want to walk with God. And I had to push through all of that. And I had to make up my mind I was going to live for God. In May of 2000, I was released. Now, when I got out of prison... I was broke as Job's turkey. I had nothing. I had $50 in my pocket. I had a pair of prison-issued pants. I had a pair of prison-issued shoes. I had a shirt that they had gotten from Goodwill probably and thrown at me. Um, I had a bus ticket. And I remember going home with nothing, sleeping in a little room that my mom and dad made available for me. All my clothes from, from when I had been out five years earlier were gone, and my brother had gotten rid of most of those, I think. I'm not sure what all happened to them, but... I had nothing, $50 to start with, but I had the Holy Ghost. And I had a God that had done a work in my life that I didn't really fully understand at that point. He had, he had led me through the process of forgiving people, forgiving family members and releasing people while I was in prison. Healed my heart in areas that I didn't even understand. And I got out and I started going to church and God started putting things back together. I got a job in the oil field for a while and worked on a workover rig in Texas. It was hot, hard work. I did it just long enough to know I needed an education. And um, I remember uh, starting school in, in uh, I got out in May of 2000, started school at the community college in August of that year. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. And I remember going onto the campus. I felt dumb. I was a ninth grade high school dropout. I was a felon. 
I, I had this record and, and I had a GED and I saw all these other students there and I just felt like I didn't belong. But the Lord just calmed my spirit and I wound up doing very well that year. I made the dean's list. Uh, the next three years, God helped me and blessed me. I got a, almost a full ride scholarship to a prestigious four year liberal arts school. Uh, I wanted to be a high school coach and a, and, a, and a history teacher. And so my junior year of college, I, I was working in the church. The pastor that had, had been there when I prayed through was now having me work with youth in our church. And, and uh, my junior year, 2002, um, I felt a call to ministry. I also met uh, a beautiful lady by the name of Amber uh, that I am now married to. She was going to Bible college at the time. And um, my, my senior year, we got married on spring break. Went ahead and finished my degree, but I knew by my senior year that God had called me into full-time ministry. Sort of traveling a little bit, preaching, eventually accepted a, uh, uh, an opportunity as an administrative pastor, a full-time job in Dallas, and we were there for three years. And uh, then we were in Orlando metro area for about a year serving at a church there. And uh, then God opened up a door for my wife and I to move here to Wisconsin to take a, what had been a, a church plant, a church startup, uh, still in a storefront in Germantown. And uh, we moved here about 12 years ago. I now have three beautiful daughters. Uh, God has restored my life in ways that I couldn't have imagined. Everything that had been taken from me, everything that I had given up, you know, good family, uh, education, uh, a place in society, uh, hopes of being a good father, everything that I had lost, God has restored in my life. Because God doesn't just deliver. God wants to restore. I'll never forget, and I'll, I'll close with this, I'll never forget when I was in the county jail, I, I wanted to go to, a, to a, an Acts class. The United Pentecostal Church International used to have a program called Acts. And it's called something different now. I'm not sure what the name of it is. But it was an alcohol chemical treatment series. It was basically like um, a Pentecostal recovery program. And so I asked a convict in there, I said, is there an Axe class in this jail? And uh, he was an old seasoned convict. He'd probably been in and out 20 times. And he said, uh, he said, Axe, what's that? I said, well, it's like AA or NA. He said, are you an alcoholic? I said, no, sir, I'm, a, I'm an ex-drug addict. Now, this is literally just probably a couple of months after I'd received the Holy Ghost. I'm 18, maybe 19 at the time. And uh, he, said, he said, no, son. He said, you are a recovering drug addict. And I said, no, I'm an, I'm an ex-drug addict. He said, you are a recovering drug addict. And I said, no, I'm an ex-drug addict. God delivered me. And he said, recovering. I said, X. He said, recovering. I said, X. He said, recovering. I said, X. And we went back and forth. He finally got tired of dealing with my uneducated nonsense. And he tried to straighten me out. And this is what he said to me. He said, he said, son, if you take a cucumber and you turn it into a pickle, can you ever turn it back into a cucumber? And man, that was good logic. But I looked at him in my, in my new convert faith. And I said, no, I can't, but God can. <laughs> and the same God that turned the water into wine, the same God that opened blinded eyes, he has power to not only extract the vinegar from our life, but he doesn't leave us a shriveled up pickle. He restores all the areas of our life and he uses the pain and the brokenness and the mistakes of our life to build and advance his future for us. But here's the thing. God will not do it on our timetable. We have got to be committed to his restorative process. If I had one word to drop in your spirit today, it would be process, 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 process. Don't quit the process. Don't try to deal with God. It's about surrendering to God's time and God's process. It's about, you know, I, I, I read a, something I said not long ago. You ever, you ever read one of your own quotes? You're like, wow, that was pretty good. I, I read a quote from myself the other day, and I was like, man, that's, I don't know who said that, but that guy's pretty smart. And uh, I said this, when, when you don't know what to do, improve. Just improve. Find an area to improve. There, there, were, there was so much I couldn't do in jail, but I could learn the Bible. There was so much that I couldn't do, but I could learn how to pray. There, there were so many areas of my life that I had no control over at that present moment. 
but I did what I could do in the moment. When you don't know what else to do, improve. Improve where you are. Improve what you can do. Learn to pray. Learn to touch God. Don't force God's hands on, on issues. Trust that God loves you and that God is building a future and a process that you couldn't possibly build if you did it on your own. I'll never forget a song that I heard when I was in one of the darkest moments of my life is during this time when I was uncertain about my future in the county jail. And um, I, I remember hearing a song come on the radio. I, I could borrow a little headset from a from a, a, another inmate there, and I, I would listen to the Christian radio station. And I, I don't even know what song this is, but I've never forgotten the, the words to it. The, the chorus goes something like this. If I'd had my way, I would have been wading through the river when you wanted me to walk upon the sea. If I'd had my way, all of my wants and my whims and my wishes, you knew how weak and how shallow I would be. So I'll trust your wisdom over mine because you have proven all the time that in my narrow way of seeing things, I leave the best behind sometimes. And I might not have stayed this close if I'd had my way. God wants to restore your life. I don't know who's listening to this. And I don't know what kind of brokenness you're coming out of. But I can tell you there's no broken heart that God cannot heal. There's no twisted past that God cannot redeem and restore. But it begins with submission and repentance before God. Somebody asked me one time, how do you go from being a convict to being a pastor? How do you go from being a convict to a guy who preaches conferences and whatever I've done in the past? I, I was preaching a men's conference one time and I had a guy ask me that. He said, how do, you, how do you go from being a convict to preaching conferences? And I said, well, there's not, it's not like there's a formula out there for it. But I will tell you this, that there's two principles that will guide your life to wherever God wants to take you. And that is, is unconditional, unconditional commitment to God. Yes. That even when it looks like God is not serving your purposes you are still unconditionally committed to him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And number two is submission to another man. And we don't like that number two. But without submission to another man, I would have wrecked my journey so many times. It is unconditional commitment to God and submission to spiritual leadership. And God will restore. If you're listening and you don't have a pastor in your life, you need to find an apostolic pastor who preaches the apostolic message. Listen, the message that changed my life, I'll never forget as a teenager, a broken teenager. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this. In fact, I won't even name the denomination. I remember going to a denominational church camp. And uh, when they were done, I, I felt something in that camp. And, and I wanted to be different. I didn't want to be this young man that I was. And I remember they gave, a, they, they gave an invitation to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And they said, if you want your life changed, just, just raise your hand or come up front. I, I don't remember what it was, but I remember responding. And they sent me to a little room to talk to a lady, a counselor. And, and she said, so you want to accept Jesus as your Savior? And I said, yes, I, I, I want to be different. I want to be changed. And, and so she took my hands and she said, now repeat these words after me. And I prayed the sinner's prayer after her and she she said the words and I said the words and she said the words and I said the words and and then when she was done she looked at me and she said how does it feel to be a Christian and I looked at her and I was like I don't think I would really know I, I this just seems kind of fake to me this just seems kind of repeating your words where's the collision with God where's the where's the moment with God that where, where my flesh meets his holiness, where I humble myself before him. And that's what God wants to give you. And if you're watching this and you're in a room somewhere and you feel hopeless and you've contemplated suicide and you've thought about giving up, can I just tell you that God's not done with your story yet. But it's going to begin with your surrender to him and your willingness to repent of your sins and be baptized in Jesus' name. Not infant baptism, but it's a, it's a moment where you decide to bury that old life in the waters of baptism. Baptize in Jesus' name, and then God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. And I promise you, the Bible says in Acts 1-8, you receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Don't try to do this without the Holy Ghost, because it won't work. 
Don't try to have transformation in your life without the Holy Ghost because you're going to stumble and it's going to be hard. The power you need to live for God comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. Changed my life. And I know that God is no respecter of persons. And I know that God will change your life as well. I'd like to pray with you right now and just ask the Lord to touch your heart wherever you're at, that, that you would be hungry for everything that God wants to do in your life. Let's pray together right now. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I plead the precious blood of Jesus over every man and woman who's listening to this testimony right now. I'm asking that you would touch their hearts. I pray that you would draw them by your spirit. Lord, that the lies of the enemy that have been telling them that they are hopeless, that those lies would be brought to nothing right now. I bind those lies in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would draw them to repentance. It is your goodness that draws us to repentance. And I'm asking for that right now, God, for every young lady, every man that's listening to my voice. God, I pray that they would, they would sense your presence and the tugging of your heart on their life. I pray right now, God, that they would be obedient to you, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that name that is above every name. And God, they would commit themselves to the process of restoration in your life. We plead that for them right now. In Jesus' precious name we ask, and we give you the glory and the honor for it. Amen. 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 Oh, that was, that was powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. You know, he shared something with us <clears throat> that a lot of us don't want to share. Uh, he, he opened his heart. Uh, there are some testimonies out there, very powerful, but people don't want to share them. What better time do we has, have as of now but to share those testimonies? I told you the, uh, the opportunity Angel and I had to teach your mom and dad a Bible study. Well, it was my testimony that they knew me at the age of 14 and the mess that I was. But then they also knew this other person. And so they accepted uh, that challenge. And once I was able to give them that Bible study, they were both baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what we can do. Some people are taking their testimony. It took God 30 years to build, and you're locking it in the safe to use it at a certain time. I don't think we have the right to, to lock God's testimony in any kind of safe. We need to open those safes and we need to start testifying and talking to people, letting people know your story. <clears throat> when I was telling you that story about my brother-in-law, uh, Corey, he works at UPS, and that round table, when he was talking to, to the five men that were in the area, and his, I believe his, he told me his supervisor was one of them, what I didn't tell you is that there was a woman after it was done, she approached him and she uh, uh, apologized for listening in on their conversation. And Corey told me that um, this woman, she was, uh, she had some needs. And one of the needs was she, she was empty. She's missing something in her life. And so Corey uh, started to talk to her and share some things. Uh, and she said, could you please send me those testimonies? Because I'm hungry for something, I'm empty. And I believe after what you told them, that's what I want. And so he opened a Facebook page just and she could uh, have that. And so I, I wanted to uh, uh, capitalize on that. Also, I am gonna ask, uh, there are many people that are in different types of churches watching us. I'm gonna ask you to make sure you continue to support your churches. You know, sometimes we think because we're locked in, you haven't been in a church house, uh, and so therefore, we're not going to support the church at this point. I will tell you uh, what Angel and I is, we mailed ours in. Old way of doing things, right? I still do write checks, even though I, I use my cards, but we did that, okay? So please support your churches, because during this time, you know, it's not like at home our bills still come. They still get bills, okay? So let's do that. Uh, and let's start using our spiritual gifts. You have them. God's developed them. Uh, uh, don't stop right now. You, it's a time for that, okay? The Bible says that God's Spirit will take over at that one time in order to minister to somebody. If you have the Holy Ghost, God can use you during that time. Uh, and so don't stop reaching your families. We got to do that. 
Uh, the reason for this, hey, I, will t I told you, our family, there's about 90 to 100 of us. And it all started with, with my mother. And we continued. We prayed every Saturday for a whole year for the family members that were not saved. And it never occurred to me once that I was sacrificing Saturdays to do that. Our family, we remember doing that. And I will tell you, God started bringing it one after the other. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, God bless. And we will see you on Thursday at 530 uh, with uh, Gerald McLean's testimony. God bless you.